competitors gear up for what would otherwise be a right pummeling. As you can see, the cumbersome headgear comes in handy. Newcastle Basketball Stadium reverberated to the sound of whip-crack kicks and banshee cries. Well, the older exponents emitted a banshee cry. In the younger ones, it was more of a yelp. One thing's for sure, regardless of age, the fighters all threw themselves into the competition. A number of sites are being looked at by the police department for the new station. However, this site off Bowman Street is the preferred location. The existing station on the Pacific Highway is extremely small. A new station on this site would provide ample room as well as water access for the police launch. The water police are very concerned that uh, they have uh, sea access and have uh, better response times for problems on the bar. The northern end of the site could also be turned into parkland, meeting residents' needs. Money does not appear to be a problem. Although the proposal is in its early stages, a local consortium is known to be interested in the site of the police station. The plan is that they build the new police station and get this land in exchange. The hope is that it would uh, cost them little uh, or perhaps even nothing. It's not known what the consortium has planned for the Pacific Highway site, nor what the state government will think about the proposal. According to Mr Bowman, there's a lot of planning still to be done. Jody McKay, NBN News. Dozier has been in the United States for the past few weeks, trying to gain a spot on the New York Knicks playing staff. But Falcons management received a call from the bulldozer today, indicating that he had missed the cut. Disappointed at not getting a shot at the big time, Dozier was relieved that he had given it a go and was over the moon at the prospect of returning to Newcastle. For the second year in succession, Dozier was voted the best offensive player in the NBL, won the Falcons Player of the Year award and is sure to be the Falcons' trump card for next season as they continue their rebuilding campaign and surge towards the top of the ladder. The menu for the Australian Conservation Foundation dinner may have been predictable, a healthy serve of protest song to get things moving. But guest speaker Peter Garrett issued a challenge to committed conservationists, sounding a new direction in the fight to save the environment. After being dissuaded from barricades and chaining themselves to bulldozers, conservationists seem disillusioned with negotiating environmental policies with the government and now feel it's up to them to stop what they say is a wholesale sell-off and destruction of the nation's resources. The Australian Conservation Foundation is leading the fight, this time aimed at the minds of a nation. Peter Garrett believes development and environment can go hand in hand, but such a match would require a moral revolution in the Australian way of life. Andrew Lobb reporting for NBN News. They called it exercise overfill, a worst case scenario accident at the Pazminko plant, 5,000 litres of sulphuric acid surging from a road tanker involved in a collision. Two people were injured, one trapped in a car covered by the dangerous chemical, 
a driver of the tanker suffering severe burns. It may have been a mock setup, but the rescue effort was real for the emergency services. With plant staff and the Environment Protection Authority on standby, fire units also had to prevent the leak from entering the water system and stop it from reaching a shed containing 10 tonnes of explosives. And like all good dramas, there was an added touch of reality, the media playing its part. With the situation under control, the analysis began police admitting there were some problems. One of them was communication. They should have established communication with the company straight away to establish what the problems they were going to face. And unfortunately, in the early stages, they didn't do that. More exercises are being planned for next year, including a possible mock plane crash. Matthew White, NBN News. The six are from the number two operational conversion unit. As players in this exercise, the pilots are learning how to cope with pressure. And the principle's simple enough. Multiple aircraft out there trying to bomb targets and uh, get out and get back without being shot down by the enemy. The enemy in this case is the United States Air Force, a team of crack pilots flying the formidable F-15 Eagle. Most of the hard work though is done poring over maps. These pilots spend very little time actually in the air. A mission can go for 10 or 12 hours and only one hour of that will be actual flying, so just a, a level of the amount of preparation before and after for each mission. This exercise is part of the gruelling fighter combat instructors course. When these six graduate, they'll become instructors in the RAAF's tactical fighter force. The four-month course winds up next month. Anthony Griffiths, NBN News. HMAS Melbourne and Sydney have been on training manoeuvres along the coast for three weeks. Touching dry land in Newcastle comes as a welcome relief. Most of the workup days end up about an 18 hour day, maybe up to 20 sometimes, depending on the, uh, the, the exercises that are going on. And by the end of a long day like that, couple them all together and make long weeks. The two frigates are midway through Operation Workup, an exercise where the sailors, initially unfamiliar with each other, learn to work as a team, especially in simulated combat conditions. The vessels can reach speeds of up to 28 knots and measure 130 metres in length. On board features include six messes and space saver sleeping quarters. Each ship has a maximum complement of 216 sailors and officers. As large as the frigates seem, after three weeks of intensive training, it's time for a break. Break. What have you got planned? Uh, a few drinks down the pub. I just play golf, I think. Have a few beers, relax. For many of the sailors, Newcastle is home port, offering a chance to reunite with family. Peter Lockwood is a Novocastrian at heart. 17 years of Navy life has offered him many opportunities. It's taken me over to the United States, to Europe, and right around the southwest Pacific. Um, but I must admit, I still like coming back here. The same goes for Maitland-born Lorraine Blunden, who says the Navy was a natural career. I mean, ever since I've been tiny, I've been running down, dragging Mum and Dan down here to, uh, to look at the ships. So I guess I always thought I'd end up on them. The HMAS Melbourne and Sydney will be in port for the weekend. They're open for public inspection on Sunday afternoon. Catherine Lamond, NBN News.
Police say the white Ford Falcon station wagon was heading north on the New England Highway at around 10 last night when the driver missed a bend and collided with an oncoming Pajero. The 38-year-old front seat passenger in the Falcon, Wendy Ross from Tamworth, was killed instantly. The Westpac chopper was called in to take the injured to hospital. A 32-year-old man and a 15-year-old girl were flown to the John Hunter. Three others were taken to Maitland Hospital. The accident could have been much worse. There were four children in the Pajero, aged between 2 and 10 years old. The Accident Investigation Squad from Newcastle is continuing its inquiries. Matthew White, NBN News. In the ring at Earl's Court, Ruddock taunted Lewis with the words, Now we meet again. Then the London-born boxer answered him back. Oh, that's a good over. Lewis described the punch as a gunshot. Ruddock's legs collapsed. He was left sprawling and senseless. This was a long right hand. And Ruddock was so full of himself and trying to take Lewis out early that he walked right onto it. Timed it beautifully, Lewis. So calm, collected, knew exactly what he was doing. Lewis meted out more punishment in round two. Twice, Ruddock was sent crashing to the canvas. Less than four minutes into the fight, the referee decided he'd seen enough. Everything just came together at that moment and it just made me look good. The longer I'm in there, the more chances that I'm taking. So that's, that's why I like it over as fast as possible. Lewis faces the winner of the eliminator between Evander Holofield and Riddick Bowe for the title. In only 14 seconds, not the start the breakers wanted. Shocking way to start, particularly when I wasn't even out on the field to see the goal. Um, you know, maybe I was better not seeing it, I don't know. I'll talk to the players tonight about it, but terrible way to start. And it really went on from there on in. We never really got back into the game in the first half anyhow. Second half, I thought we did better. Maybe created a couple of chances, but it was just a poor night on the, you know, all round, Mike. It was a battle for the breakers all night, but a better second half performance lifted the spirit slightly. But there is plenty of work to do to mould this team into a consistently winning team. Sitting on the outside, we just didn't seem as though we could you know, put one leg in front of the other. There were some reasons there that I, I can't answer for at this stage. Some soul searching to do during the week? There's been a lot of soul searching this weekend, Mike, but there'll be a lot of talk tonight. We'll have a good night tonight and we'll try and get it sorted out. Three training sessions this week and an away game. Maybe the lads might relax a wee bit, but we'll get to the bottom of it. We're too good a side not to get to the bottom of things and put it right. There is an outbreak of an exotic disease in New South Wales livestock. These are some of the people who will be called on to eradicate it. Australia is free of many of the diseases which plague the rest of the world's agriculture. However, an outbreak could be devastating. During the next three days, these employees of the Rural Land Protection Board and New South Wales Agriculture are being asked to contain and stamp out a mock outbreak of swine fever in the Lower Hunter. The disease would wipe out many of the pigs in the region. We've described a, an outbreak in an imaginary form and we're feeding information to the various managers in an operational headquarters and they have to deal with that information as though it really was an outbreak of the exotic disease. While the exercise is designed to hone the skills of those who contain the outbreak, prevention is still better than cure. Our quarantine controls are set up to try to prevent the entry of diseases into Australia so we look to people to declare things such as uh, meat products or uh, other animal products. The training program will be held in five centres across the state. Jane Anderson, NBN News.
They're off. Great start. And star of the realm on the inside, one of the first to jump out. Up zero, pulled to the outside, is making ground and further back in the field. In Big Barons, a long way off the leader. Sub zero will win the Melbourne Cup. Sub zero, two weeks to be earned across. Castletown third. Mr. It's been on the drawing board for more than a year and today the music pavilion planned for Regatta Park at Toronto was given the final once over. It's a $120,000 community project designed to spruce up the foreshore. It depicts the, um, the water, the, the sailing scene, at, uh, as you know Toronto's right on the edge of uh, Lake Macquarie and uh, we, tr we asked the architects to sort of consider that in their, uh, in their deliberations. Lake Macquarie Mayor Doug Carley turned the first sod of soil on the project, which will take six months to finish. The labour has been supplied by the Department of Employment, Education and Training. Who uh, uh, got this uh, job skills program, which uh, is employing uh, around about uh, 10 unemployed people, which is uh, fabulous for, the, for not only them, but for the, for the community at large. It will be used mainly for music shows, but it's hoped other groups will get involved as well. All sorts of things that schools might like to have, uh, particular events there, uh, presentations maybe, people might like to get married there. Work will start on the project tomorrow. Matthew White, NBN News. Senior Sergeant Rod Sonter died doing what he loved, raising funds for the community in a three-day bike ride through the Hunter in September. The ride was called off, but today the final leg of the fundraiser was completed. A cheque for $5,800 handed over to Ronald McDonald House at the John Hunter Hospital. He was a real member of the community. He wanted to do good for people and... Uh, this, I think, is, uh, really shows that uh, the guys were behind him. Sergeant Sonter's legacy will also live on in a garden at the house, dedicated to his memory and unveiled by his wife Margaret and daughter Tracy. There was also a special presentation to the late policeman's family, his colleagues from the Central Coast organising a plaque and a district citation, a fitting reward to a man devoted to the community. Matthew White, NBN News.
20 to 1, 11 to 4 and favourite and 10 to 1. The second feature race was the Honda Stakes over 1600 metres and another brilliant finish. Thirty to one, seven to one, and eight to one for the two dead heaters. It's tag team surfing, an exciting new format in contests that has captured the imagination of surfers worldwide, especially those who don't get to compete in teams events that often. This weekend's competition is being fought out between 16 teams of five surfers, three juniors and two cadets, and to add further intrigue, a change from the norm. It's quite a unique sort of form of competition, the tag team contest, and we've put a twist on it this year by having a a situation where we have four in the water at a time competing uh, as compared to two which has been used for uh, most of the tag team formats to date. The overall aim of the event is to create a different competitive environment while fostering and developing the obvious talents of Australia's young surfers. Today's conditions weren't ideal but there were plenty of cutbacks and floaters to impress the judges. It's more of an educational campaign than a blitz. The MSB and Water Police running the rule over safety equipment on boats, but handing out advice instead of tickets. No, not for this weekend. What, unless it's something particularly dangerous or someone's being extremely stupid out there, the idea is education. With summer almost here, the MSB is eager to spread the message of safe boating. Pamphlets were handed to boat owners and checks done to see if safety equipment was missing from the vessels. And although most boats passed the test, there was one glaring problem, flares. Things like flares, if you're going offshore, the flares that you carry in the boat have got to be in date. Uh, we found a lot of uh, flares are out of date and there's no guarantee once they go past the expiry date that they will work. And it's, uh, the, the boat owners have to have flares that are in date. The safety crackdown will continue throughout the summer. Matthew White, NBN News. Country was sent in and it wasn't a great start. With Country 2 down, Sue Hurd took matters in hand and took to the city attack. She belted a defiant 15 before falling to a Trish Langford slow ball. 3 for 29, Captain Lynn Larson saved the day, digging her toes in for an unbeaten 44. After 50 overs, Country 8 for 138. The country girls then went into a fielding frenzy. City's innings dotted with runouts and bad decisions. Five wickets fell thanks to some astute fielding. City was hamstrung and could only manage nine for 128 from its 50 overs. Lynn Larson was voted player of the match.
The darts were on target to raise funds for the Port Macquarie Ambulance and the Child Flight Helicopter Service. More than 20 members of the RSL Darts Club put their best foot forward, along with Hastings Mayor Ray Cooper, who kept the raffles running all night. The marathon was organised by the Blackman's Point Protection Society. After a long day and night of darts, more than 2,000 charity dollars had been pledged. Clear skies and sparkling water for the first Lower North Coast Surf Carnival of the season. It was a combined meet between senior and junior clubs at Foster Beach. The big boys cut a path out the back, the little ones mixed it up on the way back in. It was a chance to make minor adjustments for the season ahead. For the first time the day was also used as a qualifying carnival for the Nutrigrain Interbranch Series. Rescue services were called to Ilford Avenue, Arcadia Vale around 9 o'clock last night. While there were no witnesses to the crash, marks on the road indicate the driver lost control of his car, skidded for 50 metres and slammed sideways into a power pole. The Toyota Lexan hit with such force, it's believed the 28-year-old driver was killed on impact. There were no passengers in the car. Police say the street is not regarded as an accident black spot. Results from an autopsy may shed some light on the reason for the crash. Peter Ryan, NBN News.